Hello and welcome to today's webinar with Maculogix on diagnosing and treating early AMD. Before we get started, I'm going to go through a few quick housekeeping items. For those of you on our webinar today, we have you in a listen only mode, which means we can't hear you, but we do want this to be a very interactive event. So if you look uh, to the right of your screen, you'll see there's three little red dots and you should see a control panel there. If you don't see a little area to type in your questions, just click on those three little dots and it will expand that control panel. And you should see an area where you can type in your questions for us. This is going to be a Q&A event. Uh, a, 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 this is a, going to be a panel discussion. Uh, we have some questions that you have sent to us before this webinar, and we have many frequently asked questions as well. However, we are going to monitor the chat area throughout the webinar for your questions and answer those as they come in. There will not be a slide deck with pre today's presentation, but we are also recording the presentation. So if you'd like to come back and listen to this over again or share it with your colleagues, we'll send out a link to the recording in, in about a day once we have it up on our website. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our moder moderator today. Uh, our moderator is uh, Vicki Zarenko, and she is actually going to uh, tell us a little bit about her background before we get started. So Vicki, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, yes, thanks, Paul. So I, I'm Vicki Zarenko. I am the Associate Director of Professional Relations here at Maculogix, a 2002 graduate of uh, PCO. Um, I am your clinical connection um, to Maculogix. So um, as always, if you can reach out to me, um, even personally, if you have any questions, but I'm really excited about tonight's forum. You know, there's a lot of information that, that we're getting now um, as we uh, are getting back into the swing of things after the, the COVID-19 shutdown. So we thought it would be a great idea to get everybody together and, and really open it up and let you ask any of those burning questions that you have. Um, and I'm really excited you know, to have three of, of um, our AMD ambassadors here um, that can answer your questions. They are doctors and, and, and um, AdaptDX utilizers and um, are really here for, for you guys. So we do have questions that you submitted, as Paul said, but don't hesitate to jump into the chat box and ask questions as well. Um, th this is a promotional event for tonight, so there's no limits on you know what you can ask as far as um, you know what these guys do exactly in their practices. Um, but no, it will not be for COPE credit tonight. Um, that was one of our questions that we just got. Um, so I'll introduce um, our three panelists. Um, uh, I don't know how you guys are seeing them on the screen, but just give a wave um, when I say your name. So uh, Dr. Jeff Gerson, um, he is a uh, 1997 graduate of the Indiana School of Optometry. Um, he did his uh, residency at the VA Medical Center in Kansas City, uh, concentrating on ocular disease and low vision. Um, he's been on faculty at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in the Department of Ophthalmology. Um, he entered private practice. Um, he's been part of a retinal referral center and part of a lot of studies and um, authored articles and just pretty much has done a lot of great things um, for optometry. So um, anything that you want to add in your background there, uh, Dr. Gerson? Put you on the spot. Can you hear me? All right. I'll also next introduce Dr. Pam Lowe. Um, she is a graduate of Loyola University in Chicago, as well as the Illinois College of Optometry, um, where she was named the alumnus of the year um, in 2002. She also is published um, and speaks across the country. Um, she is uh, the cornea and contact lens section. Are you the chair of that now? Yes. Yes, um, which is fantastic. Fellow of the Academy of Optometry. Um, and uh, she, she was here to help us tonight as well, uh, along with Dr. Alan Hudson, um, who is in private practice in Redmond, Oregon. Um, since 1981, 
quite a, an accomplishment, um, has been on the Oregon Optometric Physician Association board um, and president from 92 to 93, um, a volunteer AO, um, at the, to the AOA, uh, AOA at 93 and served until 2012, including chairing the statutory scope committee and, um, and optometry's meeting committee. He is a vision source administrator in Oregon and his office has been using the AdaptDX since July of 2018. Um, how long have you had the device, Pam? in your office uh we've had it since 2017 or the very beginning of 20 end of 2016 when it was it was a few months after it first came out and then how about you dr gerson how long have you been using the adaptdx technology in your practice we can't hear you are you on mute If your mic icon is not blue, you should check, click on it. So let, um, we're, we'll jump into questions and we'll get your audio taken care of Dr. Gerson. So um, there were a lot of great questions submitted. And um, again, I, there are questions that you guys can submit even today. So. Let's just start with sort of at the very beginning. Um, what is dark adaptation testing and why do you use it? So why don't you kick us off, Alan? Um, dark adaptation testing, and the reason we use it is basically to be, it's a um, diagnostic and prognostic tool for macular degeneration. Uh, the easiest way I explain to patients what dark adaptation is, is I tell them, you remember when we used to go to movie theaters and you come in from the light and you walk into the movie theater and you can't see and you know four minutes later you can see well that's normal well 10 minutes later if it takes you that long it's abnormal and that's what we're going to measure is how long it takes for you to adapt to that light change and how do you talk about it pam yeah so i love telling my patients that now i finally have a tool that can pick up macular degeneration up to three years before you see a change in your vision and before I see a change in the structure of your macula. And I like to give them the analogy that in my early days of, of uh, seeing patients, the way we diagnosed AMD was a patient would come in with vision loss, central vision loss, and then I would look and I'd see structure changes and I'm like, oh, you have AMD. Now it's so awesome that we can catch the AMD train while it's leaving the station before it picks up speed. And um, it's just been a game changer in our practice. When somebody has impaired dark adaptation, when you test them um, with the AdaptDX, are there any other diagnoses that, that you have to rule out? Sure. So, you know, we started a new protocol. Everybody 50 and older in our office in the pretest gets asked, have you noticed a change in your vision when you're in dim or dark illumination? We used to say, have you noticed a change in like driving at night? But then we found we weren't getting uh, very valid responses a lot of times because when you ask a patient about night driving, they fear you're going to take their driving privileges away. So we just say simply when it, it's in a darker room, um, we love that analogy. Like Alan said, going into a movie theater, um, you know, have you noticed it's harder to navigate? And because that right away gives me the diagnosis of acquired night blindness. Now I have to determine, is it the normal cataract changes that we get at when we age, or is it actually um, macular degeneration starting to grow? And so how, and that, that's one of the big questions is how does, how do cataracts impact dark adaptation testing? Um, right. So, well, the great thing is it, they don't. So it, it delineates whether the dark issues the patient are having, the issues with their, their night vision, is actually from the cataract or is it from subclinical macular degeneration? Because their macula can look clean as a whistle. Um, they're starting to have cholesterol plaques building up and making the retina sick um, before I see it, before my OCT sees it. And so I actually have a, a protocol where every patient, before I send them to the cataract surgeon for a consultation, I actually give them a dark adaptation test just to determine if they have subclinical AMD because I do not want them to 
pay more for a multifocal implant, which if you have low contrast, which you will have, if you have um, subclinical AMD, we don't want to put a multifocal implant in to cause the patient to get glare and halos and not, you know, get that wow factor. So it's our new protocol for cataracts. So, well, so to answer your question, um, cataracts, it's, it's easy to distinguish. It's not, having a cataract doesn't deter you from taking the test. The test can be taken with cataract um, opacities, I guess, unless it would be a super dense one where vision is just down, obviously. Um, but yeah, we do them all day long. I mean, that age group all has, you know, subtle cataracts to subtle to advanced cataracts. Um, Alan, in your practice, uh, what age do you start dark adaptation screening? You know, we, we, we actually will do screenings on anybody that has a problem, generally over 55, but I've done it on people under 50 with family history. And when we talk to them about their family and just, and they're, they're wanting to get the test done because they're so concerned about seeing a relative who's had macular degeneration, their mother, their father, their uncle. And so quite often I've done it on you know, people under 50, but generally it's 55 and older for the most part, but I'm not against doing it for people under that age group. And, um, and again, like Pam, we definitely do it on the cataract patients to determine if that contrast sensitivity is gonna be affected and wanna make sure that we know what we're gonna see coming back and we've all had people who've come back seeing 2020 unhappy after cataract surgery and they were 20, 40, 20, 50 before and they come back and say, you know, I'm not seeing it as good as I thought I should. And, you know, for years before we had this type of technology, it was easy to say, oh, you've just got cataracts. And now we've got more information. So um, you're, Alan, testing based on symptoms, based okay. on... You guys hear me now? Oh, oh, we can. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. Now we just can't see you. <laughs> yeah, we can't see you, but no, we okay. can hear you. <laughs> the man in the oh, yay. yay. All right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you, what was the question again there? So <laughs> do you um, test based on symptoms, uh, based on signs, based, do you screen based on age? What What is your, uh, the what is your protocol in your office? The protocol in our office is basically we always are doing the extended test. Very rarely are we doing the screening test. And the reason is we have some um, just uh, space limitations. We don't have a room dedicated to just uh, AMD testing and dark adaptation. So we're using an exam room at this point when we have the new uh, instrument that comes out this month. Uh, in the office, we may change some of that, but we just don't. So we schedule people back generally like we will in OCT or a visual field at this point. And, and how about you, Jeff? What is the model that you use in your office? Um, uh, yeah, for so what I, yeah, so what I do is for everybody over age 16, they come in for a their annual exam. I do a rapid test on them. And so I don't ask symptoms. I don't give an option that's there's no choice it's just part of my my standard protocol what I do with them and then anyone that that fails the rapid I have them come back for a follow-up visit where we do an OCT and do the extended test and then how and and Pam what what is your protocol yeah I'm a little bit more like Alan just because of our flow um, in a normal workday and dedicated staff that we need we do have a dedicated room for the instrument but I'm always um, when, when I feel there's either structure changes, be it central or peripheral, or they have a symptom, they're um, scheduled for an OCT, baseline structure OCT, and a dark adaptation, and I would run the extended test. So let's talk a little bit about um, other tests that we can also do. So are any of you doing MPOD testing, contrast sensitivity, genetic testing? How does that fit into the, the, the flow um, when you're working a patient up for AMD? Um, so, oh. Go ahead. I'll, I'll take that. So, okay. um, so I do a little bit of all of the above, um, but the, to me, the, the big, big difference is that um, dark adaptation is diagnostic, whereas macular pigment and contrast and even genetics, that, that's all risk factor. And so, you know, what I always tell people is you can have all the risk factors in the world and never get a disease. You could have none of the risk factors and still get it. And so to me, what's ultimately most important is if I want to know about AMD, then to me, most important is do you have it? Yes or no. 
Um, anybody else do other testing as well? I think in our office, I mean, I'll, I, I do check or we'll have staff check contrast sensitivity um, routinely because uh, the uh, um, supplement we put people on has been shown to increase their, their contrast sensitivity in 11 months. And so we want to know what's going to happen, not only with the macula, but what their acuity is going to be doing. Um, so we have some questions from the audience as far as um, reimbursement. Um, and we don't have, it's going to differ across, you know, depending on where you live. But um, Pam, can you talk about uh, reimbursement as far as is the test reimbursable at, um, and, and, and how you guys work it in your practice? Sure. So once you have a diagnostic code, you can medically bill the test. So if a patient says they're noticing a change at, night, at nighttime, my diagnostic code is acquired night blindness. And now it's my job to prove where that um, night blindness is coming from. Um, what's great about dark vision, um, as um, Jeff said, it is 90% sensitive and specific as a biomarker for AMD. So I'm going to jump to that right away to know, do they have AMD or not? And then um, I bill that with usually a couple that, especially if the test is positive, it'll always be coupled with an OCT. I get a baseline 10-2 visual field. And what's really neat about dark adaptation testing is I can bill that on the same day as photos, as a visual field, as an OCT. There's nothing, obviously you can't bill OCT. There's nothing that precludes dark adaptation along with any other other test. And we do a fair amount of, of patients that we really are high risk and want to watch more closely. We do some natural retinograms too, some PERDs. So, and it's billable at the same time as all of those along with your office visit. And, you know, we're, we're taking a look at the macula again. We're discussing things with the patient. So we found from a medical standpoint, not only are you doing a better job for the patient, you're catching AMD, you know, at, at its earliest, um, um, but it's profitable from the medical standpoint. And it's not, it's great because you don't have to worry about whatever other tests you may want to run with it. And, and Jeff, you use a little bit of a different model because you're screening patients. Can you talk about um, uh, the way that your model works in your practice? It's yes. kind of along the reimbursement lines. Yeah. So when I do the initial screening, I don't charge patients or insurance for it. And the reason that I've done it that way really from day one is I don't want there to be any impediment for anybody to have the test done. And so I don't want it to be I don't have insurance or I don't want to pay or I choose not to do that. For me, it's just something that I've made the conscious decision that I've chosen that it's important enough that I'm going to do it on everybody. And so I understand that then I'm, I guess, throwing away some income on the front end because if I'm not charging everyone, but I did a study in my practice of 100 consecutive patients over age 60, all of which that on examination, I thought it was a normal appearing macula, did no CT and it was normal. And 39 out of 100 failed the rapid test. And so what that means is 39% of my patients then come back, do the extended test where we're generating around $60, doing an OCT where we're generating around $35, and then doing an office visit where we're generating another 60 to $70. So I know that basically 40% of those people on the back end are going to generate somewhere around $140. And that second visit is five minutes of my time. That's it. The rest is staff testing. So that's how I justify the not charging for the screening because A, I, I want to get everybody. I don't want patients to be able to self-select not to do it. And B, I know from a financial standpoint that I end up doing okay just because of the volume of it. And just for general information, the test is reimbursable. Um, the code is 92284, and the national average is $60.63. Um, just you know, for anybody who has that question. Um, so it's, we sort of talked about the flow and then reimbursement. So let's get a little bit into patient management. Um, so somebody comes in and, you know, you diagnose that you, you do dark adaptation testing, they fail the test, um, and then you start your work up and, and now you're managing them. Talk about how your follow up and, and how you bring them back. And do you want to jump in on that, Alan? 
Uh, sure. When a patient comes in and I'm going over their test results, I generally, if they if they failed the test, I explain to them why they failed, what's going on in their macula as far as cholesterol buildup, and that's what basically is causing that dark adaptation to be um, high um, numbers. And so we talk about lifestyle, we talk about risk factors, we talk about additional testing I'm going to do, and then we talk about supplements. And, um, you know, and, and as Jeff said, you know, He's, he's got a great model. I wish I had the room to do his model because I would do the same exact thing he's doing. But unfortunately, we don't have that dedicated room. We don't have the, um, and I'm not, after 39 years in practice, I'm not going to build a new building. So, um, but it's, it, it, it's a great model. And so I would love to do that. But, you know, when you talk to the patient about these things and you truly believe in it, they believe in it too. And whether we're talking about doing uh, blue blocking lenses and, uh, to help block blue light as a risk factor, whether we're, we're talking about smoking, hypertension, diabetes, uh, family history, diet, obesity, um, all those things at that time. Sure. Um, a lot of people at, are asking, um, you know, as far as, well, let's first go here. Is this only for helping you to find AMD at the subclinical level is, do you continue to use this device once patients develop Drusen? Um, you know, Jeff, can you speak to how, how you're using the device to help you manage your AMD patients? Yeah. So for me, the, the best analogy is that of glaucoma and really for everything about this, right? Because, you know, you do a screening visual field then you do a threshold visual field. That's kind of the, how I explain the rapid, then the extended, um, uh, as far as, as doing this. Um, but so I, so I really like making analogies to glaucoma and in glaucoma you use a visual field to help you detect glaucoma. Then you help to use it to monitor for uh, possible progression. And so I use dark adaptation the same way. And I know that, um, when, and if someone's AMD gets worse, that their time to dark adapt or the rod intercept will continue to increase. And, you know, the other thing that I think is, is kind of an, an, an important um, point to make is so oftentimes we talk about using dark adaptation to find subclinical AMD. And that's really important, right? Because that's finding AMD before you can see it and starting early. And, and that's great. But there was a paper published about two and a half years ago that showed that basically a quarter of AMD is missed. And of the AMD that's missed, a third of it is large drusen or pigmentary changes. And so if really, if I'm going to be honest with myself, then what I would say is I'm not just using this to find subclinical AMD. I'm not just using dark adaptation to monitor for progression. I'm using dark adaptation to find the intermediate AMD that if I'm like everybody else, that sometimes I just miss. And so it's, it's not just can you find something super subtle? or that you can't see. Sometimes it's to find something that we should see, but we're just not. Do you find that, Pam, that sometimes it's a little tough to find AMD in a patient? Sure, you know, on any uh, busy clinic day, um, you know, we're doing our best at all times, but you know, th uh, there's obviously patients who fall through the cracks. Um, so again, it is uh, another tool, as Jeff said, to not only detect early on, but to monitor. And one of the very empowering things that we found in our practice is when you do find a patient that's especially more early on in the course. So let's say a normal rod intercept is, you know, under six and a half minutes. So that patient that may be seven minutes, seven and a half minutes. When I intervent with talking about diet, talking about smoking, talking about the nutritional supplement. It helps, you know, this train not keep going fast down the track. Um, I've seen improvement in dark adaptation and rod intercept. So that's really remarkable. Um, and it's really empowering when you share that with the patient to say, look at what you've done. And the way I'm monitoring you, we're not only kind of slowing the progression, but like things got a little bit better, so you're holding very nicely another way to encourage the patient um, and just letting them know that you working with them as a team, that it's working and that, you know, you're going to continue to be right on top of making sure, you know, they don't go on to any further vision loss that would be unnecessary. 
So as we're using the Adaptiax and, and following these patients with the rod intercept, is the goal to reduce the rod intercept? Is it to keep it stable? What exactly, how exactly are you using that information um, to follow that patient, um, to assess their risk, uh, to manage them? Sure. So just like um, any functional test, the goal is to not get worse um, and to hold where you are. And then it's gravy if you get a little bit better, right? So we know, I know, especially when I started doing um, VEP testing, um, when we were able to charge for glaucoma with that, how we would catch things early and then actually we were catching the loss of um, nerve fiber early on when it was suffering. And then because we were interventing with treatment, we actually saw sometimes that get better. So it's kind of the same analogy. The goal is to not have it keep progressing, but, um, and then being able to monitor if it does progress, well, how large is that progression? Is it just a, you know, a few seconds, is it a minute or two? And again, it just helps you keep on track with your treatment plan. At what point do you refer a patient to retina? I don't refer a patient to retina until they have wet AM. Because what happens when you refer to the retina? I love my retina guys, but first of all, they don't look into the nutrition studies and the use of carotenoids earlier on in the disease course. They're all, you know, blinders with A reds, A reds, A reds. Um, and wouldn't even offer a patient, you know, until they're intermediate or worse, um, nutritional supplements. And again, that's just the world they play in. Why would I refer a patient to the retina specialist who didn't need injections or another surgical intervention, right? What's the point? Because I have everything I need in my practice patient here to monitor them more efficiently so that I do know when to pull the trigger at the right time when it is needed, then they would go to the retina specialist. And again, love my retina guys, but once a patient gets in that retina, you know, they're gonna reappoint them, reappoint them, whatever schedule they think. And sometimes the patient, if we're not good at communicating, the patient now gets lost to us into that whole of the, the retina specialist office. So you gotta be very, very careful. And, you know, optometry, we have the brain power, we have the technology. There is no reason to refer to retina. It requires injection. Um, so this, this comes up a lot, Alan, and I want to get your point of view on it. But um, are you recommending vitamins early? Are you waiting for them to be at the intermediate level? What, how do you feel about um, supplements early on in AMD? Well, as Pam was saying, you know, the retina and ophthalmology are so into AREDs that they don't look at uh, other options. And so I talk to patients all the time, and we, and we have people in their 30s and 20s uh, using LMZ, and uh, especially if there's family, strong family histories. And so, no, we're not waiting for that. And definitely anybody who has a, uh, fails a dark adaptation and their broad intercept is high or, and, you know, one other thing we do along with the, that rod intercept before this goes on is that we actually do check the other eye. Um, we'll do one eye and then we'll bring them back and do the other eye to make sure they are equal. I know there's a high correlation, but I've seen enough patients without that um, equal correlation that I always wonder what's going on in the other eye. But uh, yeah, we're, we're putting people on a uh, uh, LMZ at real early. We're talking to them about smoking cessation and we're talking to them about diet. And when you say LMZ, what are you referring to? Um, Macu Health um, is what I what we use in our office. And uh, I've been using it probably for 10 years. I mean, I've seen some amazing, I've seen soft drusen disappear. I've had multiple patients with uh, pigment epithelium detachments uh, flatten out. I recently had a lady who had been with me for she came to me at age 84 and she's 87. She came with me with uh, uh, pigment epithelium right in the macula uh, detachments. And three years later, they both flattened out. So, uh, Jeff, you had alluded to using the Adaptiax for not just, um, you know, this early AMD, but to also help you find intermediate because it's, it, it's not even that, you know, it, we get busy, but intermediate really actually isn't a lot of change. Um, can you go into that a little bit as well? Yeah, well, I, I mean, just in general, I mean, I think that, you know, 
because like you know we said earlier if someone has abnormal dark adaptation it's it pretty much tells you that it's amd you know to payment point it's 90 percent sensitive 90 percent specific and really the only other things that it could be would be if someone has a systemic vitamin a deficiency which is pretty rare or if someone has uh, retinal dystrophy or degeneration, which again are fairly uncommon and you would know by the time they were in their 50s or 60s. So I think it's really just finding any AMD patient regardless of what their stage is. And to Pam's point as optometrists, I think really what we need to know is, is there AMD? And so that's with AdaptDX, that becomes a fairly simple question, yes or no. And then the next question is, do they need injections? And if the answer is no, then I think it's imperative on us to, you know, keep them in our office. And I guess whether it's yes or no, to have them on a supplement. And, you know, really to Alan's point, regardless of level of macular degeneration, whether it's subclinical or mild or immediate, I think it's important to have someone on a supplement. And he brings up carotenoid supplements and carotenoids are safe. And so even if somebody brings up, well, where's the study that shows it for subclinical or for mild AMD? And, you know, they're not as big as the ARID studies. There's studies out there for sure that, that tell us that, that they're beneficial. But if nothing else, they're very safe. And, you know, Alan was talking about contrast sensitivity and monitoring that. And studies absolutely show that these carotenoid-based supplements improve visual function, whether it's contrast like Alan's testing whether it's shape discrimination, even visual acuity, light sensitivity. So that's part of the reason why I'm so aggressive with supplements because I see it as a, as a do no harm and most likely providing benefit. Do you have any concerns about zinc? In general, in general no. Um, you know, what I would tell you is that there's a fairly large uh, percentage, especially of elderly Americans that have zinc deficiencies. And so it's something that in general we don't get enough of. Um, I don't use an ARIDS-2 supplement unless someone has intermediate disease. And the only supplements that have 80 milligrams of zinc are an ARIDS-2 supplement. So anything else, so again, coming back to Alan's point, a carotenoid-based supplement is going to have a fairly low amount of zinc or a very normal amount of zinc. And I have no concerns with that. Um, is anybody using omega-3s as well? Um, I used to. I don't anymore. I think at the last ARIDS-2 study, they kind of discounted omega-3s for AMD. And you know, to Jeff's point with zinc, I rarely um, recommend zinc much anymore because of uh, the problems people have with stomach problems with zinc. And some patients don't do well with it. And in the actual ARED study recommended 25 milligrams of zinc. And so I feel 80 milligrams is a lot. And um, so I, I rarely recommend um, AREDs two unless they are intermediate or beyond. And but I also at that time we talked to them about you know uh, still going to the carotenoids. So um, there were a couple of questions around drusen specifically um, and making the diagnosis of AMD. So one of them is: Can a person have drusen without having AMD? Um, yes, um, you can have drusen, and I've, I've had people with uh, even macular drusen that had very, very normal um, uh, dark adaptation rod intercept scores below five, and so I think it's possible that they're not going to ever progress. I've, I've followed these people over the years and not ever had a problem, um, and so I think I think that's possible. Yeah. Good, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Pam. Say, I've seen that a lot with um, you know younger patients, when I say younger, like uh, late 30s, 40s, that just have a kind of a dominant drusen uh, presentation. And you could see it right in and around the neck. That's their 2015, their uh, round intercept. So before, you know, dark adaptation testing, how, so you brought up, you know, it's para, paracentral drusen, PAM, and, and then, you know, we talked about small drusen. Before dark adaptation testing, how did you know if the patient had AMD or not? How were you able to differentiate? Right, it was it was woefully lacking. Right, it was throw your Amsler grid up. Are you having? And that was kind of the technology we had. Now I was doing a PhD 
testing, but that was just specific if I saw changes where they converted from dry to wet, right? And and that's a technology that some people use on, with the home format. But yeah, you know, um, through, looking at an Amsler grid is great. Maybe the first few days they'll do it, and then you know it, it, it's lackluster to the patient. So right, it it, it couldn't have been at a better time, um, especially with me. 32 years practicing and my patients aging with me that I have this technology to move forward um, for myself. Number one, I'm a middle aged Caucasian female who's right in the risk group. Um, you know, to have this uh, type of technology just changes the way we look at AMD, the way we talk about it with our patients. I love, you know, I know Alan and Jeff, um, you know, I love these guys because we have the same philosophy. We have to talk to patients about what they're putting in their body. You know, all, too much salt and sugar ages your body, your vessels, your macula. You know, um, it's a discussion that um, this technology opens up that discussion because, number one, you're catching things early. And whether the patient is normal, I always say, oh, my gosh, isn't this great? We know now up to three years, you know, this would pick it up before I see a change or you notice it. How cool is that that you're normal? Let's do X, Y, and Z, eat better, move your body better, and we're going to retest you yearly. So it just becomes a part of what we do now, which is, to me, much more accurate than how when you see metamorphopsia. So sort of down that road, you know, using an Amsler grid and, um, you know, patients coming in with a symptom, are there other tests that you're doing right now? Is anybody doing fundus autofluorescence and does that play a role a significant role in, in how you're following and managing uh, your amd patients sure yes we do that and that's more for your geographic atrophy so it's going to help you pick up the changes more subtle changes because you're looking at that different layer that that graphic affects so it is a tool we use uh, most um i've seen most patients are in the different bucket you know i'm just more worried in geographic it change to wet at any time also but it's just, again, it's another great way to track at a higher level. Um, anything that you guys want to add? Are there, is there any other testing that you're utilizing for patients um, to help follow them a, a, as they um, sort of develop um, into the later stages of AMD? You know, the one other thing that I would bring up is for patients with intermediate that I have a fair number of people that are using the 4C home which, you know, to me, I think, again, somewhat analogous to AdaptDX because AdaptDX is trying to find dry AMD at its very earliest and 4C Home is trying to find wet AMD at its very earliest. And, you know, it's the same story for both in that the earlier you find it, the earlier you can do something and then the better likelihood of having a good outcome. Excellent. Um, so, I, I want to get into the cost of the instrument and things like that. But before that, I want to kind of go through a couple of risk factor questions that keep coming up. Um, one of them is around cholesterol and sort of the cholesterol's link. Um, so, you know, maybe Jeff, you can briefly walk through cholesterol's role um, in AMD and then um, sort of speak to when we can first really start to see it on OCT versus when we can know when it's there um, with dark adaptation testing. Yeah. So, I mean, as Pam mentioned, that dark adaptation testing will pick up AMD, we know, three years before we'll see on an OCT, which is a question I get asked all the time. It's like, well, will I, which one will I see it first? Or won't OCT see it if, if, it, if someone has impaired dark adaptation? And for me, you know, in these early cases, a majority of the time, the answer is no, they, they don't see it. And so I guess the, the simple 10 way to explain, you know, what's happening with cholesterol is we get cholesterol plaque buildup along Brooks membrane. And when that happens, then normally Brooks membrane is like a window where nutrients are flowing in and out. But when you get all these points where it gets clogged up with cholesterol plaques, then we're not getting that transport. And so what's happening, then we're getting a localized vitamin A deficiency. And so that's why then obviously we have impaired dark adaptation. And so we can't see these deposits. We can only know that they're there with failed dark adaptation. And so 
we can't see it on OCT. Can we see it on, you know, clinically? Can we see it on photography, even fun as autofluorescence? You know, in the in these subclinical cases, no. There's there's no other way to see it. This is, you know, I guess if you do a you do a section, you do an electron microscopy, you'd see it. But you know, that patient's not going to have a good outcome. So it's not worth really finding it that way. <laughs> but really, that's that's the only other way to find it. I mean, really, at least for what we have now. You know, maybe five years from now there'll be some sort of uh, technology where we can see it looking in. Um, but right now there's, there's no way, maybe adaptive optics will give us that opportunity in the future, but right now there's, there's no way to see that. And so this is our one opportunity to find it early. And, and so staying sort of with cholesterol, are any of you recommending, um, the patient be treated for their cholesterol or do cholesterol treatments have any effect? Um, in the realm of AMD, uh, there's a lot of questions around that uh, that are coming up as well. I, th I think the one study I remember reading that was kind of in that realm was, you know, they were doing studies with uh, Lipitor and finding out what, how much Lipitor would it take to affect the cholesterol buildup in the eye. And it was up to 80 milligrams of Lipitor, which is a huge amount. I mean, most of our patients are on maybe 10 to 20 and their joints are aching already. So we know we're not gonna, you know, give our patients 80 milligrams of Lipitor. Maybe there's gonna be a new drug in the future, but as of right now, most of the cholesterol lowering drugs aren't gonna be advantageous to us as maybe the, maybe the carotenoids are. Right. Yeah, and it was interesting when I was looking at the question it was um there was an association more with high hdl and mm -hmm. early amd um and like an inverse if your triglycerides were high that helped with advanced amd so it was kind of yeah, there's a lot of different studies out there so the jury's still out it's something that i'm sure that'll be interesting to study but to you know alan's point to give someone that amount of medication that can have many side effects would just be crazy you know, the one comment I would make on that and um, is that it, just thinking about it very simply is that generally healthy eyes are in healthy people. And if you kind of reverse engineer that, if you have unhealthy eyes, you want to do whatever you can to become a healthier person to try to help your eyes. And so I think in general, cholesterol management is important, just like we know that diabetes management and BMI and all this other systemic stuff, which for me helps make it easier to talk to my patients because the message that I give is, especially with these subclinical patients, is I tell them there's five, five things I want you to do. And four of them are the same things you've heard from every doctor you've been to in the last 10 years. And so those, those four things are, um, you know, either lose weight or maintain your healthy body weight. Try to get some exercise and stay healthy in general. Have a healthy diet with more fruits and vegetables and less refined carbohydrates and don't smoke. And then I stop and ask them and I say, have you heard all those things before? And they'll say, yeah, every doctor tells me that every time I go. I say, the only one that I want to do different is exactly what Alan brings up is here's a specific supplement I want you to start. And then and it makes it a very complimentary message. So even though I'm not specifically saying control your cholesterol, I'm, I'm bringing up just general health and being healthy with every patient. And have patients been, because I'm sure you're all having a conversation like that, have patients been receptive to, to hearing these messages from you as, as eye doctors? Yeah, I think that, you know, they're they're happy that we're concerned about their overall health just as their physician is and that it makes sense that it's all tied together. And so sort of on the same line, you know, another thing that we talk a lot about is smoking cessation. Um, any so one of the questions was about having that conversation with patients and have you had patients who have stopped smoking based on you know learning about the, their their eyes and learning about that they have macular degeneration um you know any stories like that that you'd want to talk about yeah so i have an interesting story long time patient hadn't been in in a while and she comes in and she tells me she's diagnosed with stage four lung cancer but she's doing well because she's on this new treatment from Northwestern in Chicago. And I'm like, awesome. So I go, I guess, obviously, you're on this protocol. And, um, you know, I'm sure so you've you've done everything the doctors have told you. She goes, yeah. And they told me just, you're doing great. So just keep doing the same thing. So I go, oh, so you did quit smoking then? And she goes, no. 
and I go, well, why not? That's you know, the lung cancer, and she was at risk for AMD too, so that's why I was bringing up the conversation. And she goes, well, they said to keep doing what I'm doing, and I never quit, so I figured I'll just keep doing it. But the even funnier part is, so this is a woman who lives, it doesn't have a car, and she lives in Chicago, so she needs to take public transportation. Okay. She goes, I know I'm going to die of lung cancer, right? So I enjoy smoking. I go, okay, but you're doing well, and so you may have a fair amount of time left. But what if I told you you're going to lose your vision from macular degeneration because you're increasing by smoking? And then she took pause because especially taking public transportation, she needs her to navigate a busy metropolitan city. So that was the thing, not, not that she may die from lung cancer, but the fact that she may lose her vision and have a, a you know, a, a decrease in her quality of life for the time she has left really made her take pause. So that was interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah I, I would say I've had a few interesting patients, nothing quite like that. Um, but I agree with Pam that, you know, bringing up that how it affects your eyes and how it could affect your vision can be really impactful for people. And so, you know, if you ask me, do you, if I think that I'm usually successful in getting people to quit smoking, I'd say no. I'd say that my conversation with them may help influence a little bit, but, you know, it, it, I think just doing our part. Interestingly, so a little different than Pam's story, but interestingly, on my, uh, yesterday, I had a patient who came in and who I'd been seeing, seen a number of times that has uh, subclinical AMD. And, uh, you know, I walk in the room and pleasantries and ask her how she's doing. She said, well, I'm doing, doing fine, but since you made me quit smoking, I've gained 55 pounds. <laughs> and, and so it's kind of like one step forward, one step back. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, so I wasn't exactly prepared for that, but, um, you know, since I think we probably all, to some degree, talk to patients about BMI and weight, you know, kind of in my back pocket for that, there's a couple books that I recommend to patients. So I said, you know what, I'm glad to hear you stop smoking. And, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to hear you're having problems with your weight. Let me at least give you a couple of resources that I have found helpful and some other patients have found helpful and see if they're helpful to you. But it, it just kind of caught me off guard when, when you know, I caused her to gain 55 pounds. It's all your fault. It was. Like most things. <laughs> um, do you, when you do talk about diet and nutrition with patients, are you recommending any specific diet? Is there one that's better than the other in your mind? I'm not sure that I recommend a specific diet. We talk sometimes about the Mediterranean diet more than, you know, we're not talking Atkins with a, a lot of uh, high protein and fats, which is going to be counterproductive to macular degeneration anyway. Yeah, I tell, you know, one one quick thing that's easy to and resonates with the patient, I say, shop the perimeter of the grocery store. It's your fresh produce. And then if you can key in on those dark greens, you know, the berries of color, the peppers of color, then go to your fresh meats, you know, your fresh, fresh, more fresh baked goods and everything packaged. That's where we get in trouble. That's where we have too much salt and sugar and all the additives that cause inflammation in our body. And we know macular degeneration is a localized inflammation in the macula. So, so it, you can make it as simple as that. Because you know what? You're, if you're too restrictive, you know, no one wants to hear do this, do that. But if you can start giving them simple tools to just start thinking about, um, it, it, it really is helpful. And then, you know, every time they come in, you just keep reiterating, hey, how's it going? You know, are you doing like that. Is macular degeneration a significant part of your practice? Oh uh, yes. I mean, I'm out of four doctors. I'm the oldest one in the practice, so I see the largest majority of uh, macular degeneration, cataract, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathies. And there's days when I don't send a. I mean, I may not do a refraction, and I may not send a single person out to the optical. And so it's a huge part of my practice. You know, the, the answer that I would give to that question is um, to anybody is that it's a bigger part of your practice than you think. And that's, that's what dark adaptation taught me. I mean, with me finding 39 out of a hundred that I would have totally missed. And so it just really goes to show me that, 
that if you don't think you're that you have a lot of AMD, then you're just missing it. You know, it's 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 far more prevalent than glaucoma. It's far more prevalent than diabetic retinopathy. It's more prevalent than both of those combined. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's something that you know, if you say, well, gosh, I had three people with glaucoma today, then you should have had nine with AMD. So I, we're, I, I would I would at least say we're all seeing a fair amount. So um, you guys talked about earlier your, your testing protocol and um, you know part of you know the, talking about dark adaptation testing and is that there is a new device that is being launched currently the Adaptex Pro. Um, so just to give a, a little background, there there are two di there are two different pricing structures of the Adaptex Pro based on your needs. Um, you can purchase the device outright, um, or there is a subscription package. Currently, about 80% of the, our customers are choosing a subscription. Um, there is a little pricing variation, um, depending on the time of year, buying groups, things like that. So what I encourage you to do is um, reach out to your regional sales executive, and they can work with you personally on the pricing. Um, so what I want sort of want you guys, you've all had the opportunity to, to experience the pro um, and just talk a little bit about, you know, the difference between the pro and, and what you have now and how, where you see it uh, in your practice and where you, how it may might change what you're doing or enhance what you're doing even just to give people some sort of real life um, uh, perspective on it. Well, um, I, I, I got delayed getting mine because of COVID, but it couldn't have come at a better time because of COVID now that we have it, because I got to tell you, we've stopped doing the desktop because you're in a dark room with another tech for sometimes six and a half minutes or longer, right? And that's not happening right now. So I'm super excited. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're waiting to get ours. I've experienced it just um, you know, in the exhibit hall situation and maybe these gentlemen, I know you, you gentlemen might have been at the meeting that I missed and actually experienced it yourself. But how awesome, you know, it creates its own dark room. It's like a BIO on their head and the artificial intelligence portion. My staff, you know, just we, we went through a video of it and they're just excited to get it in because it takes them out of that dark room. They can be doing something else while the patient is is, you know, easily running this and being directed by the artificial intelligence. And um, it could be in an open space, right? Because these these portable mm -hmm. goggles are creating its own dark room. Um, and so I, again, who knew COVID was gonna happen? You guys developed this way before a pandemic, but just for the logistics of proximity and in, in an enclosed space, you know, we're so excited to start using it. Yeah, I would yeah. say tell you that um, we actually had one in our office for a day doing some uh, some different, I guess, testing and stuff with patients. And what's interesting is uh, two of those patients were back in last week and they were kind of mad at me because they're like, why don't you have the headset yet? Why, why, why would you tell me that? Like Pam, we're not doing the desktop test. We're not doing AdaptX right now. We're not doing visual fields. Um, but they were like mad at me for not having the new one yet. They're like, why, why, why am I not doing that test today? You said you were going to have it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that speaks volumes when a patient comes in and they're like upset that you're not doing a test because it was so easy for them to do. And, and these were real life patients. So, you know, it wasn't actors. It was, uh, I think four or five people that I had come in and do it. And, um, it was pretty universal response. It was very, very easy for them to do. Uh, very, very comfortable. And I guess part of your question, Vicki, is it kind of is around logistics. And really like, you know, for, for a practice like Alan's where it's hard to do as many as, as he wants to do, having the ability to do it in any exam room or in any room really, um, really opens that up. Um, and I think, I think more people are gonna be doing more of a kind of, a, I guess, a wellness model or more screening just because logistically it's, it's, it's easier to do. So I think it's going to be really good for patients. I think the other thing that really is great for our practice, we have another practice 25 miles away, and now we can take the headset to the other practice and the patients won't have to travel to our practice uh, in Redmond to, to do it. So it's going to make that a, a much easier uh, testing situation for us. 
So, I mean, so for you, Alan, it, you know, the logistics is you're limited by your space. So this gives, it, it gives you an additional room. Yeah, um, we can, we can do that. You know, we can do it in the same room or doing the OCT. We're not having to shut down. What we're doing now is shutting down one of our exam rooms, usually on a Friday when we have a one doctor day mm -hmm. and doing all those and bringing the patients back. And so it's hopefully going to make the logistics a little bit easier for us. And uh, we did start up adapt the X again because in our county we've not had a single death and we have very low rates of infection. And so um, it's not, it, we're in phase two of opening up everything in our area. So it's something that we've, we've had people on wait lists from when we did shut down. And so we had two patients today and interesting one was 66 and the other was 78. Both had normal maculas and one I brought in because of uh, going to going to have cataract surgery, the 78 year old, and she failed, um, even though she has great result in her other eye that we did a couple of years ago. And the 66 year old, we did it because her mother has AMD and she has absolutely no signs, no health, no other risk factors other than a family history and, and she failed. And, you know, and, and share what you're comfortable with, but when, when you, knowing her family history and when you did this test and, you know, she doesn't have any other clinical signs, but you, you, you found it with testing. What was her response to it? You know, it, her, her mother is also a patient of mine who has the AMD and I know her mother um, fairly well and she's been a patient for years. I know she was a heavy smoker. We talked about that part of it. We talked about a uh, lifestyle and uh, different things like that. And so she's uh, very open to it. We're gonna bring her back and do the other eye to see what it is. And we've already talked about uh, uh, carotenoid supplementation and uh, she she's a very healthy healthy person no other comorbidities so was she um and I, was she happy that you had this technology was she what was her response uh, you know when you were able to to give her this other piece of information well, I think she was happy to know that that there's definitely a risk factor for her was the family history and that now we've pinpointed, yes, you may have this cholesterol building up. She didn't fail by very much in her um, eye. And so we talked about that and we talked about how 91% of people who fail it will develop macular degeneration within three years, as Pam said. Uh, there's still some people that aren't, but she's glad to know that right now we can put her on a supplementation that she may never ever have a problem. Um, you know, for you, for you, Jeff, you have done a, what's called a, a more of a wellness model. So you screen people, um, you know, uh, Pam and Alan do more of a medical model where there's a symptom or um, some kind of sign. Um, so I'll start with you, Jeff, because you're getting to the most number of patients, even with the original AdaptDX. Now with the pro, that the process is going to be different. But what is your number one piece of advice for people who want to get started, want to, you know, screen as many people as they can, like you did and find, you know, 39 out of 100? Um, what is your biggest piece of advice for them as they get started? Yeah, I mean, I think number one, just like anything else, you have to be bought in, right? You have to really believe it and you have to make sure that people around you know that because even when it's a headset, it's still going to take, <clears throat> you know, let's say six minutes, eight minutes, whatever to do the rapid. And so, you know, our, our staff don't like doing anything that takes up much of any time. And so I think, you know, making sure that, that I'm bought in and I explain that to my staff, why it's so important to me. To me, that's that's a big part of it. Um, I actually think the most important thing when you're going to first get started is to have your script for how you're going to talk to your patients. I think that is by far the most important thing because I can tell you when I first started doing this five or six years ago, I was not good at it, and that I was probably saying the wrong things and I was upsetting people. And the only reason that I know that I'm better at it now, I don't, I don't know how good I am at it, but I know I'm better, is because almost always when I'm done telling someone about subclinical AMD, the conversation ends with them saying thank you. And if you think about it, to have someone thanking you for telling them they have a potentially blinding disease, then something went either really well or you just gloss over the facts and didn't give them any information. And so I'd like to think it's the first of the two. 
but but I think that's I, but I think really seriously I think that that's at least as important as anything else because it's like anything else you make a diagnosis but if your education to your patient doesn't resonate if they don't understand it doesn't matter what you prescribe if they don't do it so scripting and kind of figuring out the how you're going to say things I think is is the most important thing and, and how about you, Pam? You know, how, what did you put in place um, to, you know, get, get to where you want to be as far as testing to success? You know, what is that piece of advice that you would give somebody who's just jumping into adding dark adaptation testing to their practice to, to really get out of the gate um, and maximize, um, you know, their reach? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, and just to piggyback on everything I agree with, Jeff, um, it has to be a buy-in, not only by the doctor and the proper scripting um, and us having that cold with the patient and being comfortable with it, uh, but it needs to come from the staff and it needs to come from any other associates you have in the practice because there's a lot of steps before the patient can meet, um, before I can talk about how great this is. And if all those processes and steps are in place where the person answering the phone tech running them through to the folks in the optical who know automatically why we prescribe the filters we do on the glasses, especially our patients at risk for AMD. Um, that message has to come from everyone. And then that's when um, you have team buy-in and it just makes the process so much better. Um, again, our question to everyone 50 and older is, have you noticed a change when you're in darker illumination. And if the answer is yes, we know exactly what we're doing after. But you got to ask the question first, and everyone's got to be on board. To Alan's point, I'm the senior doctor in my practice. And um, of course, I'm seeing more of the um, senior patients also. But, you know, I catch them every now and then. I'm like, hey, dude, you didn't, you know, number one ask, or that person really would benefit from a dark adaptation. You have to keep reminding because they're just, you know, in a little different mindset. Uh, but that is important. And, and the success then will just blend itself. And what's, um, that's really excellent. And Alan, what's your one piece of advice for people as they start to do dark adaptation testing? You know, the thing I think is just like if, if you're fitting contacts on keratoconus, the more you do, the better you're going to be at it. And if you're only going to do one of these a month, you're not going to be as good when you're, as if you're doing two or three a day. And it's easy to find two or three patients a day to do this on, no question. And, you know, and, and like our now with everything going on after COVID, we've got a backlog of patients that we're going to have testing. And so we're trying to bring them all in. So it's, it's easy now to do two or three days, just hard for us to find a place to do it always. And so the ADAPT uh, Pro is going to be great for being able to do that in uh, another room. I uh, said, so you don't have to expand it, it kind of expanded for you. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that we have is about, I think it looks like Jeff maybe you've answered this, um, are supplements FSA eligible? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by FSA. Yeah. Can they no. use their FSA account? Their flexible spending, flexible spending account. account. Yes, uh, my patients do it all the time. In fact, I had a patient today who I have on a supplement for a while, and she's like, oh, that was so great. She actually had a form for me. and said, because this is over the counter, but you said it's medically necessary and you're prescribing it, and it's great. Yeah, they did, certainly. Yeah, I haven't had an issue where they can't. I don't know about you gentlemen. Well, I think you hit it. I think it's the medically necessary and prescribed. If it's just, you know, someone going to the store and buying something just because they think it sounds like a good idea, that's different than one of us saying, you need to take this and here is why. And we will, we will write prescriptions for that for those patients. Yeah. So if anybody has any additional questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat window. You can also um, reach out to us if you're interested in learning more about the AdaptiX Pro. Uh, we can have somebody follow up with you. You can also contact us through our website, uh, maculogics.com slash contact us. Um, 
there are some, there's a, a six month, as, as Paul has been saying here, no payments for six months, because um, there were some questions about pricing. Um, so again, you know, reach out to us. We're happy to, to reach out to you um, to give you more information. Um, I just want to make sure that um, it looks like Paul also said your FSA website will help you, um, you know, encourage your patients to see where their eligibility, if, if they are eligible, their website should help with that. Um, so I'll give it just a minute if there are any other questions. But is there anything that, you know, we talked about a lot of topics. We talked about, you know, dark adaptation testing, how it fits into your practice, you know, the role that the, um, cholesterol plays, you know, how to talk to patients about smoking. Is there anything that we didn't, you know, touch on that you, you feel that it's important for people to understand about dark adaptation testing um, with the AdaptDX and then the, the AdaptDX Pro coming out as well, um, you know, how it can fit into the practice? I think I think once you jump on board with this type of technology, it's it's unbelievable to me what it can do for the practice and how much it consumes my time now, because I'm seeing so many more AMD patients and talking so much more about it, seeing patients back. I mean, I talk to people as oh yeah, I see my glaucoma patients every three months, every four months, and then I say how often you see your macular degeneration patients? Oh, I only see them once a year. And I think, and if you listen to Jeff's lecture the other day, he, he talked about that and I'd love to hear it again from him, but I mean, it's, we don't see those patients enough in our practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really what I said was that if you think about it, how long does it take for a glaucoma patient to have a visually significant change in their vision? And it's maybe months, more likely years. And for an AMD patient, it can be days. Yet anyone that you ask, you know, how often do you see your glaucoma patients that are in drops? It's at least twice a year. And to Alan's point, there's so many of us that if we, you know, if we asked how often do you see your AMD patients, oh, once a year, that's all they need. And so to your point, Alan, you know, I think in a very positive way, AMD will take up more of your time. And it's a great example of when you do the right thing for your patients, it really ends up being the right thing for your practice. And because, you know, I, I think it, it's worth mentioning that AMD patients are financially um, valuable to your practice. That, you know, when you take proper care of people through the exams you do, the OCTs, the dark adaptation, and, or photos or whatever it is, it's, it's quite a revenue generator. And I know that's something that we oftentimes kind of shy away from talking about, but it's something that's important because it's something that's it's the right thing for the patient and it's really good for your practice as well. And I think we don't always notice that until you really get into it and see, wow, I got a lot of this. I got a lot of these patients. And to be honest with you, for me, it's kind of fun because I would much rather tell someone you have subclinical disease, we're going to follow it. And in my mind, I, in my mind, I'm thinking five years from now, we're going to be having a similar conversation. They're going to be doing great. And that's way more fun than identifying someone and saying, hey, you've got AMD. We're going to send you to a retina specialist and they're going to stick a needle in your eye. I mean, that, it, it's not a fun conversation. So it's, it's, it's a much more lighthearted, fun conversation than I think what you would expect. Anything that you want to add, Pam? Yeah, no, uh, you know, I totally agree with Alan and Jeff. Um, it's been amazing to see how patients accept and appreciate uh, the fact that we've become an AMD center of excellence because they don't hear the message anywhere else. And I'm sure these gentlemen have, have had the same thing happen where, um, you know, they just can't find this anywhere else. So they're, they're calling friends that come in from suburbs over an hour away from me um, to travel in just to have this technology. So, um, you know, can't say enough about how exciting it is. I, I, I've been kind of doing this analogy with where we always thought myopia was just a refractive error, right? And now myopia we know is a disease. And now hopefully as a profession, all of us will be jumping on board to treat that. We've looked at AMD all backwards for so long. And now that we know better, we really need to do better with it. And, you know, that those timely visits, catching it so early now, it's crazy as a profession, especially like Jeff alluded to the number of patients that we can help 
um, it, it's kind of just, just mind blowing. So um, if I have one last piece of advice, one fun thing I've been doing, and now that we're coming out of COVID is before this, I did a couple of senior center talks and, and just even library talks on the topic of, um, you know, blue light, vision loss and things like that. And I got to tell you, it really resonates when you take this on the road, this message on the road. And now with COVID coming up, these seniors have been locked in for a while. So they're waiting to get out. So we're actually going to be doing a virtual meeting with the same local senior center in our community. But then once we can go out, I think it would be great to even like do a half hour talk or, you know, and, and you could even have a passionate staff member do that but need to get that message out. And once patients know that you have a technology that can pick it up before vision loss, um, I think you'll see it, it'll really, not only to Jeff's point, give you, you know, you're just doing the best in patient care, but your practice will benefit from it also. Um, so I, you know, as far as questions go, I think we've covered most of the topics. Um, you did touch on something there, um, Pam, that just to kind of mention, not to kind of mention, but to talk about it a little bit more in depth, how um, bringing this technology has helped, you know, other parts of your practice. Can you talk about that? Sure. So we've always had a passion for talking about what you eat, how you move your body. And so bringing this into the practice has just opened that discussion up again because we know your nutrition and how you move your body can definitely be helpful when it comes to vision loss, reducing the risk of vision loss for AMD. So um, we started doing macular pigment testing on everybody that moved to the office that and older just to open up the discussion. Did you know you have this pigment that can protect your macula from aging? And I know you're a young, healthy person, but you're a college student who just killed it, you graduated Northwestern, you got your cool job downtown, you're living in the city, you're going to Cubs games, you're going partying every night, you eat like crap, right? And we measure their pigment and it's low. Now I have this discussion to say, I know you're young and healthy, now our job together is to get you seeing well. For the long time, you're gonna need your eyes. And so it helps me start that discussion early on. It just opens up that whole macular discussion. And then if I'm training the patient correctly and they you know, they have all these years of coming to me, they're going to know that, you know, the different levels of as they have changes that I'm going to have something that's cutting edge, that's going to help diagnose early. So we, we can't say enough about these advanced technologies, especially the dark adaptation that is so sensitive and specific to some play in group. Well, great. And um, I just want to thank uh, our panelists for bringing the the real world experience they have with dark adaptation testing, which can hopefully help, you know, um, illuminate, uh, you know, all of the, the medical talk as well and make it more real. Um, and again, if anybody wants any other information, you can certainly reach out to your um, regional sales executive. Um, you can go to the Maculogic website and fill out a contact me form and we will definitely reach back out to you um, to talk about all things AdaptDX Pro. Uh, I just, again, want to thank everybody who came on for your time um, and sharing your stories and then everybody who was in the audience um, for spending tonight with us to learn more about dark adaptation testing and how it can help us manage our AMD patients. Um, so it, we'll give everybody back their evening and um, good luck and stay safe out there and, and thank everybody for coming. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Vicki.